Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Tonight we're going to be reading out of the Lord, or reading out of Psalm eleven five, the Lord that trieth the righteous. The whole verse says, "The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates." And so we're just going to read this whole psalm. It's very short; it's only seven verses. The Lord is in His holy temple. Verse one to the chief musician, a psalm of David. In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. And that's the truth. <laughs> if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous. But the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. We have an example of that in history. When we know this, that this happened, Sodom and Gomorrah, it's still there. You would have thought that would have disappeared, you know, thousands of years ago, yet it didn't. It's been there over 3,000 years. It's still there. Verse 7, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. All events are under the control of providence. Consequently, all the trials of our outward life are traceable at once to the great first cause. Out of the golden gate of God's ordinance, the armies of trial march forth in array, clad in their iron armor and armed with weapons of war. All providences are doors to trial. Even our mercies, like roses, have their thorns. Men may be drowned in seas of prosperity as well as in rivers of affliction. Our mountains are not too high and our valleys are not too low for temptations. Trials lurk on all roads. And a lot of people will say, but why does it have to be that way? Tested faith, tried in the fire seven times to come out pure and perfect gold. The Bible says over and over again, it's going to take a lot for us to enter heaven. We enter heaven under much trial. You see, if you seek to live a godly life, well, you will suffer persecution. This is just our lot here. And here's the wonderful thing about that. That equate that has value. That equates to something on the other side. When we start to learn that and realize that, we learn to give thanks for those things. Because it's a blessing. Everywhere, above and beneath, we are, I mean, listen, if you weren't suffering trials, then there's a problem. Because as a Christian, you should be. I think the Lord did this on purpose for multiple reasons, but one of those reasons is that's a mark of someone who's walking with the Lord if they're strugg struggling in life. Now, that's not the uh, end-all indicator, but if you're a believer and your life isn't that great, then, then there's a lot of problems. That's a pretty good indicator you're walking the direction you should be. If you don't have any problems, I, I might question that. Everywhere above and beneath, we are beset and surrounded with dangers. Yet no shower falls unpermitted from the threatening cloud. Every drop has its order, ere it hastens to the earth. The trials which come from God are sent to prove and strengthen our graces. And so it wants to illustrate the power of divine grace, to test the genuineness of our virtues, and to add to their energy. Our Lord, in his infinite wisdom and super abundant love, sets so high a value upon his people's faith that he will not screen them from those trials by which faith is strengthened. See, there's value to you what you endure. There's value to it. We don't understand the value, but to God, there's value to it. You would never have possessed the precious faith, which now supports you in the trial of your faith, had if a trial of your faith had not been like under fire, you are a tree that never would have rooted so well if the wind had not rocked you to and fro and made you take firm hold upon the precious truths of the covenant grace. There's a tree down in Rockport, Texas. It's the only only place I've ever seen this tree. I think it's, well, I think there's only two places in the world this tree grows. In this particular instance, this tree was transplanted. And you can go down to Rockport, Texas. You can see all the history about that. It's a weird-looking tree. It always leans away from the wind. It actually looks like it's being blown 
all the time, even if the wind's not blowing. It grows that way on purpose. That tree never, never used to grow that way because in the other place in the world where that tree exists, it's only two places that I know of. In the other place it exists, it grows normal. But in Rockport, it grows like the wind is blowing all the branches one direction. If you take a seed from that and plant it anywhere else in the world, the tree grows like that naturally. The trial of the wind upon that tree has changed that tree to the point that it's changed forever. No matter where you plant it, no matter what happens, it always grows that way. Even if in a closed environment with no wind, it grows that way. We're changed by those trials too, to the point that we become changed forever, permanently. That no matter where we are, we are always the same. That tree, no matter where you plant, it's always the same. You can Google it and look it up. It's really interesting how this tree, this only this place is where it grows like this, naturally. Everywhere else it grows or anywhere else that it grows, it grows like a normal tree, except for there. And you take those seeds from those trees and they grow that way, wherever you put them. They've been completely changed. That's, that's what happens to us in these trials and in these winds that... Winds of temptation, winds of trial, winds of persecution. You are a tree that never would have rooted so well if the wind had not rocked you to and fro and made you take firm hold upon the precious truths of the covenant grace. Worldly ease is a great foe to faith. That's the truth. That's why it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It loosens the joints of holy valor and snaps the sinews of sacred courage. I've known people that have gotten into a lot of money that were that were believers. And it was the worst torment they could ever have. They said, I wish I'd have never found this. I wish I'd have never gotten this. Because it just it changes everything. It it turns it makes you you get a lot of money, it makes you have to put your mind on the money. I don't want I don't want money. I don't want comfortable. Be able to get what I need. That's it. I don't want any more than that. I don't want to learn. In the life. I know people personally, very close to me, that play the lottery religiously and have for ages and never win. I think it's a good thing they don't win. Because they have certain things that it would be detrimental to them. Sometimes it's good to be poor. It's good to be tormented. It's good to be tossed to and fro constantly. It's good to be rocked back and forth. It keeps you on your toes. The balloon never rises until the cords are cut. Affliction doth this sharp service for believing souls. While the wheat sleeps comfortably in the husk, it is useless to man. It must be threshed out of its resting place before its value can be known. This is what's happening to the church right now. Thus it is well that Jehovah trieth the righteous, for it causeth them to grow rich towards God. You don't know that you need him until you are confronted with these things that push you to him. He opens the door, but you've got to go through. And sometimes he needs to create the scenario where we see the world and all the things that are in it and all the torments and terror, terrors that there are in it so that instead of walking to that door, we'll run to it. We'll run to him. See, even though the things don't go away, we come to a place where we stay so closely attached to him that nothing in this world can ever bother us again because we know we're safe with him, even though we're still in the world. These things have to happen. Our faith needs to be tried and tested. They got uh, different knife manufacturers. Uh, Cold Steel is one of them. They have a special process that they do. I have one of their knives, a very, very good knife. And they test them. You should, they, they have a certain thing. You should be able to bend that blade a certain distance and it should come back. They go through crucibles to heat them up to a certain temperature to give them a certain type of hardness. Some 500 degrees, some 700, depends on what they're going for. But they have to heat them up red hot. A forged blade, I have a, a knife in there, a marbles a trail, trail master. They don't make them anymore. I haven't made them in forever. I got lucky and found one private collection. Never issued, never sent out. It was a special order. Nobody ever came and got it. These people were selling their collection. I got it. And it's uh, it's forged. It's hand-forged knife. One of the very few you can buy today that are hand-forged. And you can tell it. Big difference between that and one stamped out of stainless. And it has to go under the hammer. 
has to be heated, folded, hammered down, hammered into shape, and ground. They have to go to these things to make this beautiful tool, this tool that is useful for other things. All tools go through this. All, all tools that are made go through this process of being heated, molded, shaved, ground, polished. We have to go through all this process. Well, the Lord does that with us too. We have to go through this process before we're ready for heaven. Now, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I understand it all. I don't fully understand what goes on behind this or what the, the full purpose of this is. But I know here it causes us to trust in him more. It causes us to look to him more. And it causes us to be much more stoic in a way. Not like the stoics of old, but not, not stoicism to indifference. You don't want to become indifferent. But stoic in a way that when these things come, they don't bother us anymore. It, it, it's here, they're there. But also firmly rooted and grounded where we stand. A tree that has never been blown on by the wind just puts its roots wherever. Big wind comes up, blows it over, uproots it, clean out of the ground. You can tell a tree that never really had anything hard, the winds hit it. Because one good strong wind comes and it pulls it right out of the ground. I've seen it happen. Big old root balls come up. But a tree that has been from the time it was started, if you ever dig up all its roots, its roots are wrapped around the rocks and dug down really deep and angry. You can't move it. You can't move it. It will not come out of the ground for anything. That tree's been tested. It's been tested and hardened. The wood is harder. That's the good stuff to put in the fireplace. It'll burn a long time because that tree has been beat on. A lot of people don't realize this. They don't understand why these terrible things have to happen. This is part of life, first of all. But second of all, it's something unique for us. The rest of the world, the unbelievers, these things don't do anything for them. Because they don't understand or know where what it's leading them to. For us, it's a completely different story. We know where this is leading us because the Bible tells us where it's leading us. And we know that it is making us vessels of honor worthy of the kingdom. Through Jesus Christ. See, if it wasn't for him, this would mean nothing. This would have no value. Because of him, it has value, great value. And it pleases the Father to do these things because it turns us into the people ready to be adopted into his family, the children of God. We have a great high calling. We don't understand it all the way. We don't know it all the way, but we will when we get over there. But what we go through now makes a big difference. How we endure, what we endure makes a big difference on the other side. And when we get there, you'll fully understand it. But just know that you don't worry about those things. Don't fear those things. Don't str struggle with those things. Because these things are for our, our good. All things work for the good of those that love God. These things are for our good. These things make us better. These things make us better people. They make us better able to handle the things of life. They make, it, make us more prepared for the bad stuff that comes. Because when that faith is tempered, they can't break it. They'll never break your faith. And the Lord is there for every second of it, making us ready. And so since we know this, we should thank him. Give thanks for those things. Lord, thank you for your trials and tribulations. Thank you for your chastisements and corrections. Thank you for this testing that it would prove even to me whether I am standing where I should. Whether I have integrity, whether I'm going according to what this word says, being a doer of the word and being a Berean, convicts me so that I know where I should stand instead of where I am in him. Because that's what the goal is, to glorify God, to glorify Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that we glorify your name in this life and everything that we do possible for your glory, all for your glory. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for evening devotion. It's hard. It's a hard walk. Being a Christian is a hard walk. There's nothing easy about it. I wish people would be more upfront about this stuff. Well, you're starting a journey here. It's not going to be an easy one. It's going to be a rough life. But it's going to be a rich life because you're going to experience things most people will never experience. You're going to see and know and learn things that most people will never see, know, or learn. And you're going to have a, 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 vision, a look into the future. And when you see the world, as we separate from the world and become separate, you know, as people set apart, as we see the world and all the things unfolding in prophecy, we're going to see something the rest of the world has no ideas coming. 
the wrath of God. And we have this wonderful little tidbit of information in there that there's a rescue coming, a removal. That when that woman, crowned with the stars, gives birth to that child, the child is whisked away, harpazoed into heaven, to the th right to the throne room of God. And that will be a completely different life than this one. No more sin, no more temptation, no more troubles, no more pain, no more nothing. Just peace and tranquility. I think one of the reasons why people learn to, to really enjoy peace and tranquility, because a lot of people are, they're, they're, they're not comfortable with their own company. They always need something to do. Well, go join the military and go to a war zone and do all the things you do there. I mean, when we were in training and in Iraq, it was 24 hour ops. You were always on duty. Even while you were sleeping, you know, you get called up to go do something. I was woken a bunch of times, go pull reports and, and do investigations on uh, rocket attacks and, and, and IED attacks. Go do that and then come out and not want the peace and quiet. I, I would rather things be boring and quiet. And I've become very, very comfortable with my own company. You know, you only learn that by going through the rough stuff. You only learn that by going through the bad stuff that help you learn to appreciate that. Most people, they've got to constantly have noise. They can't stand it when it's quiet. They, they, they're terrified of their own company. I love it. I love it when it's quiet. And that's because I went through the fire. We're going to love heaven because, and love that peace and that quietness where there are no more of these problems because we're going to go through the fire and it's going to be so tough and so strong and change us so much that we'll love without even one bit of apprehension. We'll love that quiet life, that peaceful life. But see, there's another thing in the Bible that says it has not entered into the mind of man what God has laid up for him. We don't even know what's waiting for us. There is so much more. Guys, this is just the beginning. We haven't even gotten to eternity yet. We're just starting the journey. There is so much more to this that we can't even possibly, can't even possibly know. But we'll find out. And we're going to find out together. Because we're brothers and sisters. And we'll be there with Jesus. Seeing all these things, experiencing all these things, and it's going to be wonderful to finally have a life of peace, an eternal life. No fears, no nothing. Just wonderful, perfect communion with God and with our Lord together forever. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.